all who come to this happy place, welcome. Please stand clear of the doors. For favor, we thank you for the so today on Miles from Main Street, I am so excited to present to you my interview with Marcelo Vignali. He spent a lot of time with Disney as an Imagineer and moved on to Disney Animation, working on uh, many movie projects there. We'll get into talking to him about how he got his start, how at age four he knew what he wanted to do and what propelled him to keep doing it. Uh, it's an amazing story. I really, really loved digging into that with him. Um, and, you know, he's so inspiring. Take a close listen to what he's talking about here when it comes to Toontown and Roger Rabbit and you know, how that propelled him into his animation career. You'll hear about his success with Hotel Transylvania and some of the things he worked on more recently with uh, Into the Spider-Verse. So, you know, this is a great conversation. I think it was a lot of fun to talk to him, and I really, really appreciate him being here. Before I get into it, please go out and share this show with a friend. Let everybody know that they need to listen to this interview with Marcelo and that we have more coming. Um, it would be really great to have you do that. It really helps our show. So let's do it. I'd like to present the interview with Marcelo Vignali. So Marcelo, thank you so much for joining me. Uh, it's an honor to talk to you. Uh, how are you doing tonight? I am doing very good. Thank you for having me. I'm really excited about this podcast. Uh, we're very excited as well. Um, so as we get started here, you know, I just kind of want to give people an idea of who you are and where you got your start. Oh, that's a, I guess that's a long story. The, when I, you know, it had, I think it started when I was four years old and my mom took me to go see Fantasia and my head exploded. Uh, because it did everything to me. It, it made me laugh. It terrified me. It had me in complete utter awe and wonder. And I remember that after that, it was everything. I, whatever it was that was Disney, whatever it was that, that dealt with animation, I wanted to learn about it. When I saw the dinosaurs in Fantasia, you figure I was four years old. When I saw the, the dinosaurs, I thought they were real. I didn't understand what animation was. Uh, it just, the whole thing just looked real to me. Like it was a real thing. That's incredible. And from then on, I was just hooked. So everything in my whole mind and everything just revolved around just trying to understand that. And there was a show called the wonderful world of Disney that was mm -hmm. uh, still on the air. Walt Disney had passed away by then, but it was still on the air and they they would play cartoons, animated cartoons, uh, like little snippets of it. Sometimes the cameras would go backstage and that was a thing. Look, every Sunday they had this and every Sunday I was glued to the television set because it was, it was like this peephole into this world that I wanted to be a part of. And that was it. And that sort of sent me on this trajectory throughout my life. And I, I would have to say it's kind of been my, my North star that uh, I always, I always knew where, you know, where I wanted to be and, and how to guide myself because of that, that tremendous experience to say it was, it inspired me would be an understatement. It, it would have to be that the movie traumatized me, <laughs> <laughs> you know? And I think that sometimes like when, when you think of different people that, you know, that their whole lives end up changing or they're forever transformed after a particular event, that's what that film did to me. Uh, that's, I mean, to know what you want to do at the age of four. I mean, that's, <laughs> yeah, that's pretty it gave awesome. Me that clarity. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, having kids of my own and, and having them starting in college and trying to decide what they want to do, it, it must have given you quite a bit of um, relief to know that you knew exactly where you were headed. You know, I think that there is, there's something to that. 
uh, and I, I sometimes joke around that, you know, you know, people are like, oh, you know, you're so gifted, you're so talented, and, and they assume this aspect of me, and I, and I joke around and tell them, well, I felt as though I, I wasn't cluttered with different options. I knew exactly what I wanted to do. I knew who it was I wanted to be. And I wasn't distracted for by all these other things. Now, there was a short time that I was distracted when I was a teenager and I started boxing. And I, and I tell you that, you know, during the time that I was boxing, I wasn't drawing as much. It was not, it, it was something that really did hamper my, my goal of going after this you know, this artistic person that I wanted to become. Mm -hmm. uh, once that, once I put that behind me and from then on, it was a straight line and it was a focus to do animation, to work in animation, to do illustration, to, you know, develop this aspect of myself, a cinematic aspect of making art. And, uh, I, I really do think that it was that lack of distraction that allowed me to really focus on my career. A lot of people, they're very talented, they're very smart. And because of that, they have all these, and sometimes they get distracted with all these other options. And, and it doesn't give them the clarity and focus that I had. For me, it was sort of like, I know it sounds foolish, but I'm just putting all my eggs in this basket. I am going to be an artist and I had no plan B. This was it. <laughs> <laughs> well, and it's, it's worked out. I mean, gosh, I just looking through your Facebook has been a treat. Um, I'm so glad you're putting that out there and, and, you know, like everything you see it, it that you've been putting there is just kind of like, how is that, that you're drawing that? Like, it's just, I, not being an artist myself, I have, I, I'm always wowed by the art. Um, but back to like that drive and that focus, like, was there somebody there guiding you along the way? Because I've, I know a lot of people as they come up in that stage of their life, there's usually a, somebody helping them keep that clarity. Yeah. You know, it, that guiding light, that force, that mentor was Walt Disney as you know, <laughs> crazy as that seems. It really was Walt Disney. That was the the guiding light. Uh, my mom worked in factories. My dad was a bricklayer and then later turned to, to working in body and fender, fixing cars. So my family, oh, and, and we're immigrants also. My family had come over from Argentina. And so they, they didn't really have the expertise in art or the experience or exposure or anything like that to guide me. And so... I didn't have any real direction. I remember thinking when I was younger that I just wanted to be a really good artist and I didn't know any good artists. I didn't know, <laughs> I didn't understand it. I didn't understand the industry or anything. So I remember thinking like, well, I want to be a good artist like Michelangelo. That was it. And that was how, how simple my understanding of the art world was. But it was the films of Walt Disney that really made me sort of appreciate and and gave me that clarity of focus that I, I wanted to use my artwork to, to inspire other people. I wanted to use my artwork also to tell narratives. And that was the, the focus. Now I, I had a really interesting experience. It was the first time I, I actually encountered an artist and I don't even know uh, the, the name of the artist. This is because so long ago. And I'm thinking I was about, oh gosh, maybe seven or eight, something like that. It might have been some somewhere around there, and I, it, my family comes from Argentina, and there was uh, we were living in Maryland, Baltimore, Maryland, and there's uh, and Baltimore, Maryland is just one big giant. The state, whole state, is like one big giant harbor, and this and this state actually surrounds that harbor, and um, and a ship was coming in from Argentina that was bringing in merchandise or whatever. I don't know what they were. It was a cargo ship. And so I don't know how they worked it out, but my parents had gotten in contact with these people that, that, you know, you figured there was no internet, right? This is like in the seventies. There was no internet. There was no way to get in contact with these people. I don't know how they did it, but somewhere along the line, they'd gotten in contact with the ship and they knew when the ship was going to be coming in. And when the ship came in, we went, we drove to the Harbor to meet them because in Maryland in the early 1970s, there were no other Hispanics. There were no other 
people that spoke Spanish. Uh, you know, here in California, it's a it's a very diverse culture. There's a lot of people coming in from uh, from uh, Central and South America, but in Maryland around that time, there wasn't. And it was it, more or less, it was just our family. That's the only people that we knew that that spoke Spanish and and had this connection with South America. So this other this other group of people were coming in, and we had to meet them. We we knew the ship was coming, and we had to meet them. <laughs> so my my folks drove out there. And we, uh, we got on the ship and the captain was taking us and giving us a tour. And it was, it was a very small, it wasn't like a very big cargo ship. It was a small cargo ship. And I guess it had a crew of maybe five or eight people, not very, not very many people. So you had a couple people doing the engineering stuff, other probably a person steering the ship. And they probably had some other people that were helping with the cargo because they used the longshoremen once they get to the, sh- the docks. The longshoremen are ones that are that empty all of the merchandise. You don't have to bring all this crew. So anyway, it was a very small crew. And as it, as he's taking us through, knocks on the door, open up the door, and it was one of the crewmen. And inside his very very tiny little uh, quarters, there were drawings taped all over the walls, and they were oh. like Western drawings, like he was a comic book artist. And they were, they seemed uh, looking back, they were sort of like Mobius inspired, you know, like you had these beautiful, like landscapes with these uh, monument valley kind of rock formations and cowboys and horses. And I remember I just, I blurted out, I just said, I'm an artist too, because <laughs> I was desperate. I, was, I, I didn't know any artist, and he was the first one that I had encountered. And I just blurted it out. And he looked at me and he smiled and he says, oh, you are, huh? Well, come here, come here. Show me what you can draw. And he got me a piece of paper and a pen, and I sat there and I started drawing. And then the tour, I'm like, well, we're going to keep going, but we'll leave you there. And so I stayed with him in his cabin, and I was drawing uh, with him. And that was so much fun. And when I look back, that was, you don't really realize it at the time, but that was the seminal moment that made me believe that I could be an artist. It, it was it was a wonderful moment um, because up until then, it's all a fantasy, right? You don't really yeah. think that these things are capable, uh, you know, that you're capable of, of, of becoming this. And I don't even know if he was a professional artist at all, but in my eyes, he was. He was... The, the only artist I knew. He was the greatest artist I knew. And when he invited me to come draw with him and he opened up this opportunity, I, I felt welcome. I felt inspired. I, I felt, uh, you know, it just made a profound effect and, and a difference in my life. That's an amazing story. I love that. So you, I mean, you took this and you obviously propelled yourself to quite an amazing career. Um, and when you got going with Disney, it, correct me if I'm wrong, but the first project you were on was with Muppets, right? Yeah, it was Muppets. And you were doing that out at Hollywood Studios down at Disney World, um, or at least that's the project that you were working well, that's on. That's where it was going, but I did all the work here uh, from California in Glendale at the Imagineering okay. office. Yeah. Um, and I, you know, I've, I've looked at some of the stuff you have on Facebook, but... Um, it seems like that was quite a an awesome time for you as well. Like it kind of fortified what you were doing uh, with Disney. Yeah, you know, it's an interesting thing because when when I was going to art school, the the entertainment industry was in a state of collapse. Today, despite the fact that it's struggling and these things are happening, you know, like with the strike and everything, mm-hmm. that the that the industry is struggling, the industry exists. And at that time, the industry was in a state of implosion. You figure that in the early 1980s, that War- uh, Warner Brothers had stopped making animated movies. Hanna Barbera also had stopped making all those films. You remember, like they were making all of these tremendous shows. It was, you know, Squidly Diddly. It was Lippy the Lion. They, they had all of these characters, and they, it was a warm yeah. right after. And they created this film glut. And then the entire studio seemed to just like a, like a star that went supernova and then it collapses in on itself. 
mean, this is what was happening in the industry. Even Disney, Disney ran into trouble. They they had put out the movie Black Hole. It didn't perform as well as they had hoped. And then they had these other films like The Black Cauldron that also uh, per- performed really poorly. And then so the studio was in the state of contraction and they were deciding whether or not they were going to abandon animation altogether. As a matter of fact, they were talking about selling off the animation division. It was going to be sold separately from the studio. This is before... Um, Eisner came on board and he had brought this idea of how they were going to try and monetize the, the studio. But when that happened, I'm, I'm in art school. So this dream of mine of working for Disney and working for you know, in animated films or, or even something like the theme parks, th- that was gone. It didn't really exist because the industry doesn't exist. And I remember I was doing my artwork and my artwork looked like it came out of an animated film. It had this sort of Disney appeal because that's what I wanted to do when I was pouring that into the drawings because that's how I was measuring success. And I remember my teachers, and it was more than one of them, they were trying to dissuade me. They could see that I had talent, but why are you wasting your time drawing this stuff? There, you, you shouldn't be doing this. You should be doing this other thing. You should be making this you know, doing more adult uh, illustration as opposed to what looks like kitty, kitty drawings. And I was so stubborn and I was so set. And I, like I tell you, there was no plan B for me. (laughs) And I thought, you know what? I am going to work in this wheelhouse of, you know, Disney, wonderful entertainment. I'm going to work at this. I'm going to do this uh, for a living, whether there's an industry or not. And so when... Uh, I started in animation. I got out of school and started in animation in 1987. In 1988, the Roger Rabbit comes out. Mm -hmm. And in 1989, the Little Mermaid comes out. And suddenly, this whole resurgence happens, not only for Disney, but for animation and entertainment. And I was at the right place at the right time. I was, my portfolio was ready. I was cutting my teeth as a professional. And then suddenly everything opened up. And then just to go from 1987, where the my teachers are telling me there is no industry. What are you doing? You're wasting your time. To just to 1990, I'm working with Jim Henson at the Disney Studios, and I'm designing the rides for them. And so you think in that just that very short span just a span of four years, I was do, I was already living my dream. It was really amazing. I, I couldn't believe that I, I was living this life. Uh, yeah. The, I mean, <laughs> to hear you talk about working with Jim Henson, like that was, he was always a big character, I guess, in my life. Yeah. Like I, I loved watching the Muppets and, um, I, I so wish that the amount of stuff that was planned for Hollywood studios could have been finished. Yeah. He was our Walt Disney because since Walt Disney, uh, you know, he passed away just, it was a little after I was born, he had passed away. I think he passed away in 1968. And I was born a little bit before that, that, you know, we never had that where we could listen to him talk or, he was doing a presentation or we went somewhere right. and Walt Disney was there and we didn't get to see that, but we did get to see it with Jim Henson with Jim Henson. It was about watching Sesame street when we were growing up. It was mm-hmm. about watching the Muppet show when the, in, in, in that heyday of the Muppet show and seeing all of these characters and he was introducing these characters. You've never seen it before. Like the first time you see Bunsen, Honeydew and Beaker and you're like, Oh my gosh, that is so wonderful. I got to see these characters again. And then he's introducing yeah. all the, and then Gonzo with the chickens. We'd never seen that in Sesame Street. These were all new characters and he was so creative. And he really, it, it was like he had his finger on the pulse of our age at that time. And I was, I just felt that it was such a tremendous privilege to work with somebody like that. And then also with the artwork that I was doing to get noticed by him. And that was always, that was something that was really special uh, that, that I, I got a chance to be part of it. As a matter of fact, I even have this. And I know that it, I know it's not a, it's just going to be dialogue, but you can see it. But I have <laughs> here this uh, watch 
that was given to me by Jim Henson. Now, this is, a, it's a watch that wow. other people have, you know, you, you can buy this, you can buy a version of this, but this was the gift that they would give people uh, at the Henson Studios. Like if there's some relationship that they want to cultivate and, uh, and it was given to me by Jim Henson himself. And I just, I, and I look, I still keep it in the little plastic and I get it out <laughs> on special occasions and put it on, but it's just such a special thing. Uh, and, and you're absolutely right. I really wish that we could have made that project or that, that project, that the deal was, was perhaps a little bit more set and that it wouldn't have fallen apart. But mm -hmm. it was at the time where they were still in negotiations when we were working on it. So when he passed away, negotiations weren't set. And part of what right. Disney wanted was they tried to hire Jim Henson, but it wasn't that they were hiring or that they were trying to option the Muppets, like you would option Marvel or, or something like that. They mm -hmm. wanted to option the, the Muppets, but they wanted to bring Jim Henson on board to provide that creative leadership because the studio understood that you know, since Walt Disney had been gone, the studio didn't really have creative leadership. Now, Eisner knew that he brought this leadership of marketability, this, this consumer products uh, kind of mindset of being able to monetize the studio, but he didn't have creative leadership and he understood that. So they tried to bring Jim Henson on board to provide that. So naturally, they, they, there was one deal that they were trying to make with Jim for that reason. But when Jim out of the picture, then suddenly the value of that relationship changed. And that's when everything sort of fell apart, unfortunately. It's really too bad that that is what had happened. Um, it, it, I think having Jim in with Disney would have been a really neat marriage to have seen. Um, and, and we still see the, the effects of that today where they now have the Muppets and they, they're still kind of trying to figure out what to do with them. Um, yeah. 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 It's a shame. And I'll tell you this, when, when we, when we were dealing with the Muppets, obviously the Muppets were going to be going into Walt Disney world, but there was also talk about putting the Muppet theater where Toontown is right now. That's where the Muppet oh. theater was going to go. And they thought like, well, we could open that, that whole area up and, uh, and, but it wasn't as big as it as Toontown is today, but they were talking about putting it in that space. And I thought, oh, that's that's kind of a, a, a wonderful idea if we had something like that. But then what ends up happening is when that deal falls apart, the idea of opening that area up stayed. And then we were when we were <clears throat> when we were negotiating as to like how we where are we going to put Toontown? So Toontown, the idea of Toontown kept getting bigger and we're trying to figure out like where this is going to go. There's the theater right across from the little train station. And then there's the area that goes directly, uh, you know, where Toontown is today. Mm -hmm. And there was a debate as to where Toontown was going to fit. And then there was also, it's interesting, uh, we were also thinking of that Toontown would go there and the theater would be taken out and that would be turned into the Hundred Acre Woods. So you would have... Winnie the Pooh, this Christopher Robin world, then you have the train and then go underneath the train and then you would have Toontown. And, uh, and then that we just ended up with Toontown, of course. Wow. I didn't know it, that Winnie the Pooh thing would have been cool to see as well. I, yeah. Anything they eventually the made. Love. <laughs> yeah. They eventually made Winnie the Pooh. They did the Winnie the yeah. Pooh ride, but that came many years later. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but so now you were working on a Muppet, Muppet movie ride. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, and did that, do you know if that idea kind of shifted into the the movie ride that they ended up is now gone, the great movie ride, or, or was that kind of something that was happening well, at the same time? Yeah, It was, you know, Jim and, and his writers, they loved parody. Yeah. And uh, so we were, it, it was kind of a, uh, a nod to film because it was going into the uh, the MGM Studio Grand uh, that they had in Florida, mm -hmm. and uh, so that's where you know this this whole thing was going to go. And so we thought like, okay, it has to be sort of film related, and so that's what that was. So it's the Muppets version of the 
uh, uh, of that storytelling, right? So right. you've got the, you know, let's say Dr. Shivago, and then you have the Muppets version of it. Or there's like that one drawing that I did that you saw on Facebook, which was mm -hmm. the, it's sort of like an Indiana Jones where he's rescuing, you know, Kermit is rescuing Miss Piggy from the waterfall. And, and it's this really sort of exciting thing in, in the way it's shot and everything. And we see the film and then our, our ride vehicle takes us past the film. And then we go backstage to see how it's made. And that was the joke. So the joke was always, it was a, like a two panel gag. One is that we get to see the film as it was presented in the theater. And then we go backstage and see how they made it. And that was the joke. And that was the contrast between that. So it was always, it looked believable in the film. And then when you go backstage, it's just Muppet Mayhem. And that's where you can see the <laughs> drawing that I had where just, oh, chaos is just breaking out. It And yeah, I can just picture that because I don't know how many times you see gigs like that with the Muppets where in the movies even like you flip around the set and it's just craziness behind and yeah I love that gig um well let's let's shift over to Toontown a little bit you had brought that up um and I know that you posted a, an excellent little story about how Toontown is um probably the biggest project that that means the most to you um because you got to work on it at every single level and yes Yes, you know, as was, you said, yeah, that's not common within the industry. No, the thing is, as professionals, the business is more compartmentalized. In animation, you can see it where there's a background designer and then there's a background painter. Then there's the animator and then there's the person that does the in-between. There's another person that inks and then another person that does color for the characters. So there's all of these different disciplines that come together in order to mm -hmm. make some of these films. Well, theme parks is very similar in that way that you have people that there's an illustrator, there's another person that's coming up with concepts. There's another person that's doing uh, the ride or another person that's doing the layout for the land. But I, I, I feel like I was very fortunate that I just had an opportunity. The opportunities kept presenting themselves and I kept taking them. Uh, these things were presented to me and uh, I was, I, I think my skill level has always been such that it has allowed for those opportunities to open up for me. And I, I think there's also another advantage that happened is that, you know, how is it, you know, I was, I was 20, I was 25 years old and the studio had trusted me to be one of the four principal designers for the Toontown project, 25. And yeah. I'm one of the four principal designers of the Toontown project. And then I become the lead designer for the Roger Rabbit ride. And they gave me a budget of $40 million to create this ride for them. And when you think about it, like they, they trusted a 25 year old with that. You know, how did, how did that opportunity happen? And what happened was that the studio wasn't that excited about a Toontown because there were oh, other things that were oh. happening. They were working on this thing called Westcott, which eventually mm -hmm. ended up becoming California Adventure. But they were thinking of creating an Epcot in California where the, where the California Adventure is right now. And so they were busy trying to create what that was going to look like. And it was beautiful and elegant. And they had all these ideas and all these designers were were fighting to work on this project. And then there was the other project, which was the Indiana Jones uh, land. It wasn't just an Indiana Jones ride. It was a whole land that they were going to open up and it, it affected the jungle cruise. There was going to be a roller coaster ride that uh, was like the you know little mine car rides from mm -hmm. the, I think it's the second Indiana Jones. And so there were different things that they were doing in that area that was going to open it up. I think they had that they were re they were going to redo. So they had the ride. They had they were changing the Jungle Cruise ride. They were adding the roller coaster. And I can't remember. I think there was something else that they were. I think they did something with the treehouse. So all of this was going to be all in the, the Indiana Jones land, and everybody I had no was, idea, <laughs> and everybody was excited to work yeah. on the project. And they were. It was a tremendous. Um, it had a tremendous budget. Just think the the 
Indiana Jones ride, just the ride alone, the budget was almost the same as it was for all of Toontown, including the Roger Rabbit ride. All wow. Of and uh, so you imagine it for many people, it was the idea of Toontown was sort of like, it was like the kiddie pool. You also had at the same time that was being developed was the uh, Tokyo Disney Seas. And so it was going to be a new Disneyland park in Tokyo that they, where they were going to be developing the, a theme park centered around the ocean. Mm -hmm. And so it was all high tech and it had all these wonderful things and these submarine rides and all kinds of crazy things. It was absolutely stunning, beautiful. So when you look at the, the panoply of all these different projects that they had in their roster, and then you look at something like a Toontown, Toontown wasn't that exciting for a lot of the people there. Okay. And it, and it afforded a 25 year old an opportunity to work on this project. And look, I couldn't be happier. I was very happy to be working on this. Why? Because I love animation. I love Disney. I, I love the, that whole uh, vintage look to the animated buildings uh, and the characters. That's what I wanted to do. And here I was, I was getting that opportunity. Now, granted, the, we started out with a big budget and then uh, halfway through the, the studio, uh, there was sort of like a a collapse of the economy at that time. Uh, and it, and it happened right around the time that we were, we had already started development. So everything got pulled. Westcott got pulled. The, uh, I think the Tokyo Disney seas was uh, pushed back. They also took the, um, what's the other project that they were working? Oh, the Indiana Jones land turned into just the Indiana Jones ride. So they cut all of that stuff out. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and in the, in order to make the Roger rabbit ride, they, they have our budget, they cut our budget in half. So we had to do everything for half the budget that we were, we were set out to, but even still, look, we, we had, we had a really good, strong idea. We had a really good crew and we worked to be as frugal as we could and, and make really good sound decisions that made for a really wonderful park. And I'm, I got to work. So I, I got to work on the land, the initial land, the concept of it, what it was going to be. I, I did the initial sketches for the tree house. I did the concept for Goofy's bounce house. I also did the, uh, I did the, the train station or yeah, the little train station that's out in front of the land. I designed the fire station with a little fire truck that sits out in front of the, you know, just as you come into the park, it's like one of the, the centerpieces for the land. And, mm -hmm. uh, and then after, um, oh, and then I designed uh, not just the buildings, but then also the ride vehicle that goes up and down the land. And again, it's usually they separate those disciplines, right? And here yeah. I was, I was given an opportunity to design the trolley, the Toontown trolley. And then I started working on the interior of the ride because I could draw characters in animation, animated characters. I, I have a hand for that, having worked in animation. Okay. It was a natural for me to become the designer for the Roger Rabbit ride. And so I worked with a, with a fantastic crew and, and I was in charge of leading what that was going to look like. And that's, that's what I did. I, I led that crew and, and we did the, the, all of the interior for the Roger rabbit ride. Now you, you said the budget was cut in half yeah. and you guys were very frugal about it, but like, what does that do to you when you are in the middle of a project and they've cut your budget? And now you need to figure out how to do what you want to do with half the money. You know what? It, I tell you the, I think the best version of the ride was the ride we built. Because what happens is that when you, when you've got a bigger budget, you're not, you don't have to be as careful mm -hmm. because you, you've got this big budget. You don't have to be as careful, but when you have a smaller budget, you have to be frugal and you know this with yourself, right? Like if, you know, you've only got a certain amount of money and, and you wanted to go out with some friends and. You, you're very specific about what it is that you want to do. It's like, well, I'm saving this money because I know that we're going to, we're going to go to the theater and afterwards we're going to get coffee. And so you, you make sure that 
that you're doing that as opposed to before you go in there, you go into a bookstore, you're buying books and then you go to the theater and then you come out and you go get some dinner and then you go get coffee. No, you're very, you prioritize things. This is what I want to do. Well, we did exactly the same thing in the ride. We were figuring out, okay, these are the things that are important. This is the best way to do that. And then we, we tried to build out those things that we wanted to see and then use flats to, uh, like let's say the bull in the china shop to use these flats that would give us a sense of dimension without creating dimension and you know what that did that allowed us to make those rooms smaller so that our track uh, uh had a bigger show to run through okay you know, okay because if not then we would have we would have made these dimensional spaces and we would have filled it with things, dimensional things. And I don't think it would have made the show better. As a matter of fact, it would have eaten up more real estate. So we would have actually seen less, but because we were being more frugal about what it was that we were doing, that we had to, we had to understand like where we were going to spend our money. All right. We know. And, and here's an interesting thing. We, we had, they were planning to build this, Roger Rabbit. And this Roger Rabbit was an audio animatronic Roger Rabbit. And they took us to go see it. And the, the, the skull of the Roger Rabbit would shoot up. His tie would start to pinwheel. And, you know, cause he would end up with this gigantic mouth, kind of like a Tex Avery cartoon. And the tongue was flapping and his eyes would bug out. Uh, but sure. when we saw it, I watched it and, and it, and it hits and it does this whole thing. And you're seeing this several seconds as you're watching this. And, and I'm like, I, I'm not exactly sure where we can see that because in our ride, we're spinning. It has yeah. to be a quick read. I don't know mm -hmm. that we have enough time to set up the gag and then see all of this uh, audio animatronic. And then they gave us the budget they, or they gave us the price tag on this thing. And it was a budget buster. And I said, you know, as much as you, R and D had been developing this thing with these latex eyes and they were pushing out all of, you know, to get the, the big, you know, cartoon eyes. But I told him, I said, I can't put that in the ride. Not only is it too expensive, it's going to break our budget. We're going to end up with one effect, but I'm not even sure the audience is going to see it. You know, when he's getting electrocuted, I, I, I'm not sure because everybody's laughing and spinning. All they need is a quick read. And so that's what we did. I, I, I told my friend, Andrea Favilli, who was working on the ride, and I told him, I said, you know, I, I wanted, <clears throat> I want to do this scene, but we can't use that figure. How can we do it? He said, you know what? I know a fr friend of mine is a magician. He makes the, uh, uh, the, the best magic tricks for like David Copperfield and all of these other people like Siegfried and Roy. He builds all of their, their effects, uh, their stage effects. We should talk to him. So I went over there and, and I told him, I said, well, you know, I, I've got this idea for what I want to do with this and that. And why don't you tell me th these, um, how to make these effects? And he said, no, it doesn't work like that. <laughs> I said, okay, well, how's it work? And he said, you tell me what you want to see and I'll figure out a, a way to do it. And I said, okay, well, we've got two effects. One of them, one of them is going to be that the Roger Rabbit gets electrocuted and we see his skeleton. And oh, yeah. and what's the other thing in this in this audio animatronic figure? They had blow molded all of it in this uh, plexiglass, and then they had a neon tube skeleton inside of it that they were illuminating. Oh, <laughs> at, at the same time! So not only did he scream, but then everything would turn off, and then he would have this skeleton that would illuminate. It was it was so incredibly expensive. So I told him, I said, I need Roger Rabbit to get electrocuted, and we need to see his skeleton. And then on the other one, we, we have to take a black hole, put a black hole on the wall, and we're going to drive right through that black hole. Now, the R&D department had also offered us this other thing, which was, how are we going to do this trick? And they said, well, we'll project the black hole onto the wall, and uh, we, or actually, we'll project a brick wall uh, over this, this um what do you call a fog curtain? We're going to drop a fog curtain, project this. Oh, okay. And I'm like, but the fog curtain will move and the bricks will look like they're moving. And it's like, well, that's what we've got. And we'll, and we'll project this, this uh, uh, hole 
And then the audience will go through the hole, but it's a doorway. And I'm thinking like, wait a minute, how, how do you project a hole, a hole, an absence of light? You can project light. You can't project an absence of light. And they're like, just, well, that's what we got for you. So th there's two things were unsatisfactory. One of them I didn't think was be convincing. And the other mm -hmm. one I didn't think, well, I, I thought was too expensive. So how do we do this? So he's, uh, and uh, this magician, Jim Steinmeier is his name. He, he proposed these two ideas. They were so darn clever. And I am not going to divulge how they were done because I, I, I've, been, <laughs> I've been sucked into this oath of the magicians, you know, where you do not reveal the secret. But it was yeah. so wonderful and it was so simple in how we did that. And that was another one of those things that we were able to do something absolutely fantastic and much better than, than what would have been uh, done had we ended up going with some of these tech solutions. We have something that is absolutely fantastic and wonderful. And when we see Roger get electrocuted, it's a quick read. We look, he pulls the, sw the switch goes down. He gets electrocuted, smoke comes out. And, but if you're spinning, you could even miss it. You, you might even miss it because you're sitting, spinning around laughing with your friend. Mm -hmm. And that's when we go into the uh, giant explosion scene. But it was one of those things that, uh, that it just kind of fell into our favor to not go with the tech solution. We, and if we had a big budget, we wouldn't have thought about it. We would have just, uh, I wouldn't have called Jim Steinmeier. And I think the product, the, the project would have been less as a result of that. But because we had to be frugal, we reached mm -hmm. out to this magician and, and he gave, he delivered an absolutely fantastic thing for us. And, and I'll tell you this also, I know I'm chatting your ear off, but there's the other thing is that what a lot of people don't know is the ride used to be a two-story ride. Really? Okay. It was and so you so the building was actually designed to be two stories, and our ride vehicle would go up the second story, ride around, pop out one of the little. There's the when you're looking at Toontown, there's like this big platform uh, that's it's like a balcony area, and it's really big mm -hmm. and wide. That's where the ride was supposed to pop out. So you were okay. riding the ride and it would go upstairs and you would pop out through that section and you would go back in the building. And we, we planned for it. So we designed it, the exterior building and everything. But then we ended up having problems with our, uh, our ride vehicle, that our ride vehicle did not have the power to go up to the second story. There were some technical problems that, that prevented us from, from being able to do that, especially the fact that we ended up going with tandem vehicles. So we, we weren't able to do that. And so we lost that. We lost that ability to go upstairs. And you think like, oh, we lost all of that real estate. No, this is a crazy thing. Because we had to use this ramp, you know, the ride vehicle, you know, isn't a very strong, it's not like I can go up a staircase or something, that mm -hmm. uh, it, there, was a, there was a ramp area going up and a ramp area going down. And it ate a lot of the real estate on our floor plan. When we so by, yeah, so when we yeah. lost the upstairs, we actually gained footage on our floor plan, <laughs> and so it, it it actually gave us more show, more opportunity for show, and it was one of those things where like just coincidence after coincidence, and some some of these things that seem like they were. Uh, negative attributes like, well, our budget was, was cut and well, this other thing was too expensive and we couldn't use it. And well, we can't go upstairs actually ended up falling into our favor. And like I said, we ended up with the best ride. So by the time that we finished designing the ride, it was, and by the time it was built, it was the best version of the ride. That's, you know, that's such an incredible story because it's so much in contrast to how Walt would operate where it was, I'm, this is what I'm doing. Roy, you go find the money. He didn't care about the budget. Whereas, you know, it's a different world, a different time. And you have to build within those constraints. And it, it it's so interesting to hear that, that difference, you know? Well, you know, I tell you this, I, I beg to differ that he, he did care about the budgets. He was very smart. And, and although a lot of the people that I worked with at the studio were like those old timers, a lot of those old timers, they were all gone by the time I got there. There were mm -hmm. still a few old timers there and I got a chance to have lunch with them and chat. And I also uh, would hang out with John Hench and John Hench was Walt Disney's right hand man. When, so he brought him over from animation and he knew that he was very intelligent 
and also somebody who had a lot of ideas and he was a he was very much a doer and Walt Disney tapped him to come on board and to lead the Imagineering studio and I got a chance to, to meet him as an old man and I would go and hang out in his office and his office was Walt Disney's old office so you figure Walt Disney passed away 1968 and then from from that time to about 19 19- 90. And this is when I first met John Hench. I mean, it wasn't that many years in, in that span. You know, it was like, you know, 20 is, is some years that mm-hmm. uh, in that span that, uh, that it happened. But nonetheless, he kept everything exactly the same as Walt had it. It was Walt's desk. It was Walt's library uh, or his uh, bookcases. You know, he kept the office as it was. And it was so incredible to be sitting in that office. Uh, you know, you could definitely sense the, that Walt Disney vibe. But he was telling me that Walt Disney never wanted to bury the money. He said, uh, if you're spending, if you're spending a hundred dollars on the show, I want the audience to see the hundred dollars. I don't want to put, you know, oh, um, there's fifty dollars that are going to go into the show system, and then then there's like another twenty five dollars that are going to be going here. And by the time you get to the show, the audience has only seen a twenty five dollar show. And he said, "No, he said, we're spending that money. I want the audience to see it." And in that regard, I think that the Roger Rabbit ride is very faithful because the money that we spent is the money on the show. You see the show, so there's no complicated, you know, systems where we had these audio animatronic figures that were budget busting and, uh, and we're spinning and we're not seeing it. No, all of the money that was spent was spent on what the audience is seeing. And I think that that's why that show has been a favorite for so many, because when you go there, you know, it, it's not only an eyeful, but every time you go on it, you see something different because you're, you're spinning around, you're indexing your car in a different way or, You've got somebody with you that you're horsing around with as you're steering this. You can steer your way through it. You can spin your way through it and, and just engage the ride a different way each time. And I think that that's what makes that ride so unique. It, it is a work of art. So um, well, I'm you so, so glad, you know, with it, this last redo, um, I'm glad that it it remained. Um you know, Roger Rabbit, I think, was a really big piece of Disney history that needs to be, you know, kept within the parks as best as they can. Yes, so. it turned the studio around. You know, when that happened, the the entire studio was, or the entire animation industry and Disney were in a lot of trouble when mm-hmm. uh, before that film came out. And that film really turned things around and showed everybody or, or showed all of the business people that there was a tremendous hunger for that sort of entertainment. There was people wanted to see the animated characters. They wanted to go into this world of imagination and fun. And when that movie came out, it opened everybody's eyes. And from then on, the you have all of these investors started to believe in this and then started to support these ideas. And that's where you had this whole, you know, string of movie animated movies and all of these people started getting in on it. It was a uh, you you have uh, Universal getting in on it. You have Warner Brothers getting back into it. You've got obviously you have Disney, and then DreamWorks came out of that. And then you had studios like Blue Sky and you had, uh, studios like Pixar. All of these people started to believe in this entertainment, but all of that didn't exist up until Roger Rabbit. Yeah. <laughs> um, so for us, we got our first trip to Disneyland um, just back in February and Toontown was just starting to reopen. They had just opened um, Mickey and Minnie's Runaway Railway there, which is amazing. Um, But they didn't have Roger Rabbit open yet. Um, We got to play around with the firehouse. Uh, I have put a bunch of videos out of both my son and my daughter trying to blow up the um, the firehouse and having an excellent time doing it. And so that's a very memorable piece for us that I can share with you. But um, I, we, we have plans to go back in June and uh, Toontown in its full glory is 
on the list. Roger Rabbit might be number one on the list. 1A because Haunted Mansion was in its cleanup stage and we didn't get to ride it when we were there. So we, <laughs> we have to do that too. But <laughs> um, it's something that, you know, as I watch live streams and people are going on Roger Rabbit, it's, it's one of those regrets that I did not get to go. So um, hearing these stories and hearing what's gone into it is just going to build it up so much more for me when I go. <laughs> yeah, wonderful. Yeah. I, I hope you get a chance to to, uh, to go and, and to, the ride will be open. The, the ride, one of the things that you'll notice on some of these other rides, uh, let's say, you know, a ride that's more complicated and they have these audio animatronic figures or some of the show systems are the ride is heavily dependent on these show systems, but the Roger Rabbit ride isn't like that. It was specifically designed rain or shine. That ride can run because you've got in that, the scene with the black hole where Roger puts the black hole in the wall and we drive through it. That's how that effect works. That effect works whether or not Ra Roger Rabbit is moving. Oh, Okay. And then the the electrical scene also is one of those things. It's not a complicated. It was such we had such simple solutions. Everything was show action, which is that instead of when you think of like a the difference between audio and audio animatronic figure would be a figure that kind of like a human. It it, it can move a crank, but in in a show action, it's the crank that moves the figure. And okay. it looks exactly the same. So I tried to make sure that whatever it was that we were doing was show action animation as opposed to animation so that it could run, so that it could run nonstop and we wouldn't have those problems. Uh, so hopefully when you get there, <laughs> I, I, I'm pretty sure it's going to be running and you can enjoy the ride. Yeah. And I'm excited to do that. That I mean... Toontown being down and, and Haunted Mansion being down were the oh, two things that really, was, yeah. That was a one-two punch right there. Yeah, it was. <laughs> yeah. I'll tell you what, I, I, there was another thing that I, I had done right before the park opened up. Uh, we, were, we were walking through the queue area and they had all these oil or these dip drums, you know, all these drums with dip that, that mm -hmm. were there that the audience, you know, the audience can sit on them. You're going around them as you're waiting in line. And it had a cap on one of them and I turned it and it was open. And I always carry <laughs> with me a clipboard because I always, I'm always drawing, always taking notes, always studying things. So I had, obviously I had my clipboard with me and it was open and I'm like, well, they're going to make a final pass and they're going to seal all these things up. I thought, okay, before they seal it up, I'm going to drop a drawing inside there. Oh, oh. <laughs> I, I did a, I did a Roger rabbit drawing. And, uh, I signed it and I dropped it inside one of those drums. I don't exactly remember which one of the drums I've got an idea about which one it might be, but that I've rolled that drawing up. And so just know as you're going through line, now the drums are all sealed up and it, they won't open it up until look, the ride <laughs> is long since gone and somebody prized that drum open. But yeah. uh, when that does happen, there's, they're going to find a Roger Rabbit drawing by me inside one of those drums. Now, nobody can go and try to open these things. <laughs> no, that would deal. Be... <laughs> you would have to literally saw the top off of it um, to get into okay. it. Right. Even if you unscrewed it, let's say, because they would weld them shut. Even if you unscrewed that little tiny, you can't get the piece of paper out of that because I rolled right. it up and then dropped it inside. That, yeah, so uh, just know that it's inside there and some, someday somewhere along the line <laughs> that, <laughs> that uh, somebody's going to open that up and they're going to find a drawing inside there. We're always looking for hidden Mickey's. Now there's a hidden Roger that. Is That's right. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so, okay. So eventually you move on from Disney um, with, the trajectory of your of your life and and how you wanted to be working for Disney that must have been a difficult decision. Now, what happened was that it was at the end of the animation cycle. So, when when I was working over at Walt Disney Imagineering, I I knew that I always wanted to go back to animation. So I did. Okay. At a certain point, this is when. 
this austerity hit and the projects, all the budgets were sort of put on hold. And I found myself designing a lot of merchandising spaces. And I thought, no, you know, I, I imagined something different for myself. I wanted to continue with this, with this idea of, of doing animation okay. uh, because that was my original goal. I have to, you have to remember, I, there's no plan B, right? <laughs> <laughs> so I, I ended up leaving Imagineering and, and people thought I was nuts. You're like, you're leaving a, a, a theme park design, Imagineering. You, you've already have, uh, you've started as a show designer. You became a concept designer. And then they, be, they made me art director. I mean, this is before I was even 30. They had made me art director for one of the lands that, the, that they were proposing at the time. And so when I decided that I was going to leave and I was going to go into animation, people were like, what are you doing? It's career suicide. Why would you do this? But again, it was one of these things that I, I had this goal for myself. I, I envisioned that I wanted to work and create this lifelong dream of working in animation. So I went on board and I started working on, on the animated films. I worked on Mulan. I worked on The Kingdom of the Sun, which later became The Emperor's New Groove. Then it was it was the other, oh, Home on the Range. Then it was Atlantis. I even had a, although I don't have film credit on it, I did work a little bit on Fantasia, which was sort of this wonderful life cycle to have uh, become part yeah. of that thing that inspired me. Uh, it was Lilo and Stitch, Brother Bear, and then also I worked on an early version of uh, the movie Frozen. And this is when it was wow. movie 2D. But it, uh, but it was right at that time when the industry was changing between 2D animation and CG animation. And it was right at the same time that 9-11 happened. <clears throat> and so all of the budgets just were completely, uh, they were put on the shelf and they had to stop because they weren't sure where things were going, especially between the industry that was in transition, the dot-com crash had happened just like a, a year or two earlier, and then 9-11 happened. So the, the, everything just got sort of put on hold. And Disney, I think, had acquired Pixar at this time, and then Pixar was going to be their animation studio. Mm -hmm. So th they ended up cutting my contract, and... Uh, and I had this sort of a, a question of like, well, now that this, you, you forget, like I've been so focused, there's no plan B. What is my plan B? I've already got this yeah. tremendous legacy with the studio working, having worked in these animated films and then worked in theme parks. What's going to happen for me? And a lot of people that I worked with had retired, you know, that they, well, I, I don't want to. I don't want to continue uh, in this business now that the business is changing. But I thought, well, number one, I was too young to retire. And I thought what I need to do is I need to find out how they're making these computer generated films. And so I, uh, there were an opportunity opened up for me to go and bring all of my knowledge, all of my wisdom, all of my expertise and go to this little startup company called Sony Pictures Animation. And, uh, I, company. Th that was a little <laughs> company, right? and it was a startup and I went over there and I, I helped, uh, you know, I, I brought my expertise as to how we were going to make some of these films. And I worked on everything from open season. It was uh, surfs up. It was cloudy with a chance of meatballs. I became the production designer for hotel Transylvania, which turned out to be one of the biggest franchises for the studio at the time. Yeah. And I worked on the Smurfs and then I worked on uh, Into the Spider-Verse, which brought the studio their first Oscar. And then I worked on a film after that, which was called Vivo. And then I, and then I actually left to go back to Disney. And that oh, was okay. the going back into Disney television animation. So this was a third part of the studio, uh, that the uh, Disney studio. So now I had worked at, theme park design, I, which was Walt Disney Imagineering. I worked at Walt Disney feature animation and now Walt Disney television animation. And again, I brought my expertise. I helped write the documents, uh, how we were going to be doing development. I hired the team. Then I trained the team 
and we were working to do development. Now, this was going to be for all of the product that was going into Disney Plus. So that's what that okay. what I I was brought on board to move the or to manage the content that we were developing that was going into Disney Plus. But again, it's one of those things that life has a way of uh, of the sort of moving the game. You, you know, you think that you're playing Parcheesi and then before you know it, the game changes and you're playing Monopoly and you're, you know, you, you have to adapt to whatever it is that's happening. And that's exactly yeah. what happened. That when COVID hit, the studio had to lock everything up. They couldn't run their ships. So all of their cruise lines were, were uh, not available. The, right. They closed down their parks. They closed down the theaters. So, you know, Disney was an entire studio that was made of, social interaction and that's what was shut down so they ended up cutting a lot of contracts and that was when they cut their contract with me as well but uh, but i uh, you know still today you know that the the people and and the system that i put in place is still being utilized so it's 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 like i'm still there <laughs> well if i could back up a little bit i mean when you went into animation you were working on some big name movies oh, yeah. um, for Disney, you know, and you were doing some character design too, right? I was doing a little bit of everything. And I think part of that is, that, you know, for most people, they, they see it as you're doing, like I said, it's very compartmentalized. You're either a character designer or you're an animator or your background designer. But for myself, because I can do all of these things that they usually put me on the front end of projects to develop them. So it gives me an opportunity to design the backgrounds and design the characters and then paint these things and do all of that all at the same time. So that's the sort of thing that I was bringing to the studio as I was trying to create what that was. So it was a little bit of everything. On a project like Brother Bear, it was mostly character work that I was doing. On a project like uh, the Kingdom of the Sun, which turned into the Emperor's New Groove, it was a lot of background design that I was doing. Okay. The same thing with uh, Lilo and Stitch. It was coming up with these backgrounds, but also not just backgrounds, but also coming up with ideas. That was one of the things that I found that I, I seemed to have a knack for because for me, the, the drawing is the easier part for me, just executing that. And for a lot of people, it's a difficult thing, but for me, it, it seemed to come easier for me. I realize that now in hindsight, that for me, it was more about the ideas. For me, it was more about, oh, I would think about something, problem solve it, and then have, apply my talent to it. So whereas I think other people, that it, the task of drawing or designing is so daunting that sometimes they have um, pre-prescribed ideas of what they can deliver and they work within that framework. And for me, it wasn't that. It was, well, what idea do I want to see? And I would visualize it in my head and then simply draw it. So um, that's where the studios found, you know, whether it was over at Disney or whether, or Disney Features or Disney Television, or even at Sony Pictures Animation, it was at utilizing me, not just for my ability to draw, but my ability to ideate, to come up with ideas and come up with new ways of seeing things. And that was, I found like, oh, I, I think that's my strength is having ideas about things. We often talk about CEOs for the company and, and how they need to get back to dreamers or just people that have new ideas. And I, I, so I'm going to put your name up there as <laughs> <laughs> we need an idea guy. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Um, but, you know, you mentioned Emperor's New Groove and you were saying, backgrounds and it immediately hit me like that movie has always been a, a beautiful movie to me like just the backgrounds and and you know it doesn't get as much praise as it probably should but um you know fast forward to hotel transylvania and you were given some awards on that right yes i, I was nominated for production designer of the year on that project that and also surfs up i'll tell you this about surfs up because a lot of people you know, you, you see the work and you don't know some of the backstory that comes along with it. When I was working on Mulan, I, I was working with a really, really wonderful and talented group of people. But that story actually begins with Mulan being a little girl. 
mm-hmm. and she has this pig that she has befriended and it's her little compatriot. And instead of having like a little brother to get into mischief, she has this, this little round fat pig that gets into mischief. And I remember seeing all of those sequences of her riding her pig, uh, break, you know, doing, creating chaos and mayhem in her village and getting scolded for, she was that little tomboy that had this, this relationship and she's kind of quirky and this, and she had this funny character that she was interacting with. Well, all of that stuff got cut from the film. And I thought it was absolutely wonderful. The development they had on it, the, the heart that it had, that character was so wonderful and so special. And, and so it got cut and it, it, it went away. And I was working with Chris Sanders and Dean de Blois on that. So they were, they, uh, this is Mulan. And I think mm-hmm. Chris Sanders was head of story. Then we're working a few years later, we're working on Lilo and Stitch. And Lilo and Stitch is Mulan when she was a little girl. All of those concepts about this, you know, funny, quirky little girl, even the same little haircut that she had was the same thing that was on those storyboards. So I I, I believe the character was developed uh, on Mulan. And it was such a wonderful and endearing character that uh, she persevered and got her own film, which was Lilo and Stitch. And instead of having the little pig, the little pig turned into a little alien that was sort of like a robust <laughs> little character. And, and it was wonderful mm-hmm. to see that connection. But then, you know, years later, we're working, I'm working on Surf's Up uh, over at Sony. And one of the guys, one of my friends, Armand Serrano, came on board that project to work with us. And as we're designing the jungle, uh, Armand, and I'm designing and drawing all these trees, and Armand says, why don't why don't we just make it look like the work we did when we were on uh, uh, Lilo and Stitch? And so the on Surf's Up, when you look at the design language, a sort of flowing design language that, that you know, this was how I uh, approached design and how Armand approached design on Lilo and Stitch. We took that and then we just went right, we fell right back into it and are working together as a three-dimensional version of what that jungle looked like. So you can see the progression of these ideas and, and how they, they inspire these other ideas and this lineage of ideas as it continues to go through. And so you can see that as, as you thread through those different projects and through the decades. Well, now I'm going to have to go watch some of that and see if I can pick it yeah. out <laughs> that i i really appreciate that story that's that's really cool yeah you know you were talking about hotel transylvania and i went off on this tangent you know going that's okay <laughs> talking about the this sort of like how these things come together but i but the same thing happened on hotel transylvania where that you know i had i had been at disney imagineering doing theme park design as we were working out all of these you know these spaces and i was also one of the things that Disney does on the Disney property is they build these hotels. And we went to go see some of these hotels that, that they have. There's one that's called the Wilderness Lodge. And it was mm-hmm. this incredible, incredible space. It's just absolutely beautiful. If you get a chance to Google that, see the, the Google the Wilderness Lodge over the, on the Disney lot. And I remember that when the, uh, the space is so big that the only way they can really sort of control it so it doesn't become over overwhelming but allows you to engage the space is the way they lit it and there was one of the people that had done the lighting uh, that i had made friends with and they were talking to me about that they were saying like this is how they lit it and everything and i'm a curious person i have a cu- very curious mind and this was something that was very engaging to me well all that information you know it, it just right, went right into the hopper right I, i'm carrying it around <laughs> uh, fast forward to here I am working on Hotel Transylvania and I have to design a hotel. (laughs) Incredible, isn't it? The way that all of that kind of just comes together and stitches together. So I have to design this hotel and I'm designing this big giant medieval hotel. The first thing that came into my mind was the Wilderness Lodge because it was so impressive to me and how they Mm -hmm. control the light. So when you look at what was done on Hotel Transylvania, how, how they, how, how we controlled the light inside that space. It was 175 feet uh, long. When you look at the, the, uh, the length of the lobby, 
it, it was 175 feet. And I thought, that's a really, really big space. How are mm -hmm. we going to make sure that this doesn't turn into an airport, like an, like a, um, uh, an airport hangar? Right. It could, it could turn into that very easily. It would just make yes. empty space and it would be very ugly. And so I started to break things out in the same thing that was done, the same knowledge that I had, I had acquired when I was working at Disney Imagineering of how to design a hotel and how to control these spaces with lighting. I broke them up in the very much the same way, inspired by the wilderness lodge that, uh, that I had seen when I was on the property. Uh, the Wilderness Lodge is um, one of our bucket list places. I just love going there and, and oh. standing in that lobby. It's just yeah. Well, that's the closest space. you'll get to Hotel Transylvania because <laughs> 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 that was the inspiration for Hotel Transylvania. Yeah, that uh, love hearing that. That's awesome. Um, <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, you've you've definitely had you know, and still are having quite a career. Um, is there anything you can share that you're working on now? Unfortunately, no. <laughs> the, uh, one of the, the drawbacks of working in development, because like I said, be, because of the, my ability to draw different things, you know, draw the characters and backgrounds and paint them and make them in, and put them in believable spaces, I'm always front-ended on a lot of projects. And so I, I do a lot of development for, for these projects. But unfortunately, because that that's the most secretive part of the yeah. industry, which is any projects that are in development and everything that I'm talking about right now are all those projects that have already come out, but anything that's in development right now, I just can't talk about. So a lot of times I'm sitting on a lot of secrets like, wow, I, I hope, you know, people, when they see this, it's going to knock their socks off, but I have to keep my mouth shut. But, um, <laughs> but right now, uh, I'm, I'm working on a whole variety of different things and it's probably, I'd have to say it's probably one of the most exciting times in my career that, you know, just the, the well, breadth fun. of things that I'm doing. And, uh, it, and again, it's one of those where it, where I started from with, you know, that little kid sitting in that theater being inspired and traumatized <laughs> with with story, with visuals, with creativity, with imagination, and making this incredible, having this incredible career and having all of these opportunities open up for me and line up. And, you know, the relationships that I've had, like the going from that person that I met in that ship at, when I was about seven years old, uh, all the way through to, you know, the opportunities that I was given on Toontown, the, the opportunity to work with Jim Henson, the films, the way they unfolded for me. And I, I, I've truly been uh, so richly blessed, and uh, and it and it's hard to fathom the how things lined up for me in uh, in that way, especially when you consider from that from that moment of me being four years old, hiding, hiding <laughs> behind the the chairs in front of me because I was afraid of Chernobyl when the Night on Bald Mountain sequence was happening. I was so terrified. Uh, I, I was high. Yeah. And I, I didn't even want to see it. <laughs> uh, that, that movie has been big for me too. So um, I can definitely understand like the hiding part. Um, yeah. Where can we find you if we want to find some of your work? Yeah. I, I, you can see me on my website, which is Vignali studio.com. I have a blog also. I know that a lot of people don't do blogger, but I still have a blog. And if you go to my website, vignalistudio.com, there's a link to it. You click on it and it takes you there. Unfortunately, what happens is I've got it my, on my computer. It says that, oh, this, uh, if you click on this link, you, go get, you could get hacked. But it's, it's simply that my website is linked to it. And so the, <clears throat> the computer thinks that the, someone else is linked to it. Well, it is. Oh. It, it's me that's linked to it. <laughs> but the, uh, so there's that. And, uh, also I have a Facebook page that I, uh, uh, update as well, where I post artwork. And then there's also on the professional side for those people that are interested, uh, as, uh, from the professional side of entertainment and they can find me on LinkedIn under Marcelo Vignali. Okay. And I will, um, I'll link to some of those spots so that, uh, people can come find you and, um, learn more about you. Um, 
you know, it's it's been just an honor being able to speak with you and hear about your career and some amazing stories that you told us. So thank you so much for joining us. Well, thank you so much, Brad. No, Brian, I'm sorry. No, thank you so much, <laughs> Brian. <laughs> I, I, I really appreciate the opportunity just to uh, reminisce about some of these ideas. You know, it's funny because you don't, you know, for the most part, you just go on about, about your day and, and then you don't, you know, cover all of the, the history and connect all the dots until you're actually talking with someone about some of these experiences. And you know, you, you've afforded that for me and I appreciate it. What a terrific interview that was. I had such a great time. Thank you again to Marcelo for joining me. This has been an honor being able to talk to him. I hope everyone was able to get so much out of listening to him. He has so many great stories. You know, the next time you ride the Roger Rabbit cartoon spin out in Disneyland, pay attention to those barrels and try to think of which one he may have left that drawing in. I mean, what what an Easter egg that is. You can tell everybody, hey, you know, there's a drawing hidden in one of these barrels. Um, just Just an awesome story there. But, you know, at the age of four, knowing exactly what he was going to do and then getting that propulsion from that artist on the ship, like, wow, like that was the catalyst I was looking for. And he got that in the strangest of places, but amazing nonetheless. I love hearing stories like this. I always know that there's going to be something that pushes someone to keep going. And and that really was that foundation for him. And look at what he's done with that. Like, you need to get out to his Facebook page and check out some of his work. His drawings are incredible. And you're just going to, you know, love the stories that he puts with his drawings and see some of the stuff that that's going on. You know, one thing that I did mention to him is that Disney recently at Destination D23 announced the uh, Pirates themed lounge that they want to put in near the Pirates of the Caribbean ride in the Magic Kingdom. And how cool is that? If you go look at his Facebook page, he has some haunted Harbor Galley drawings out there that he had worked on back in the day. Something really cool that he did, and it would be neat to see some of that come forward with this new project that is going to be happening in Magic Kingdom. At least I hope it does. I think that'll be a really, really neat space if they are able to build that. But Marcelo, one last time, thank you so much for joining us. Uh, It's been an honor, and I appreciate it so much. Go out on Facebook. Find us. We're at Miles from Main Street. A reminder that uh, Topper has been posting within the Miles from Main Street community group. He has been recently posting some drawings from fellow Imagineers that he has. And I got to see that book. It's so cool. And he's wondering if you guys want to see more of that. And if you do, please go out there and uh, comment underneath. Let him know how cool this stuff is so that he knows that you want to see more. I would love to see more, but he, he hears that from me all the time. So... Uh, please let them know and uh, find us on Instagram at miles from main street there as well. As I said, I'll be posting in the show notes, links to Marcelo's Facebook and his website. But as we like to say, some live close, but others don't. So let's talk about it. We'll see you next time on miles from main street. <laughs>